Hey everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of Ask Google Cloud, the show where you get to ask Google Cloud experts your burning questions like, are dogs or cats better? I'm just kidding, that's gonna be way too controversial, so we're just gonna stick to cloud topics. I'm Stephanie Wong, a Google Cloud developer advocate, and today I'm joined by Martin Omander, developer advocate for Google Cloud, serverless, and James Ward, also developer advocate, also focused on serverless. So today we're going to be answering questions submitted by you, our amazing and dynamic Google Cloud YouTube audience. We're always looking out for your questions about Google Cloud products, so be sure to leave any questions you might have in the comments of our videos using the hashtag AskGoogleCloud. We actually read them. Yeah, I know what a concept, right? And if you also have other questions that come up as you're watching today, please type them in the live chat and we will do our best to try and get to them all. We'll be hosting Ask Google Cloud segments throughout the year, so be sure to subscribe to the channel to get notified every time a new episode comes out. With that said, let's go ahead and get started with today's topic, all things serverless. So our first question comes from Aja Yana Deep, sorry if I butcher names, what workloads work well for serverless? I think this might be the million dollar question of today. <laughs> so uh, Martin, why don't we go ahead and start with you? Yeah, uh, we, we do a lot of surveys with developers and ask them what they use serverless for. And one of the top use cases that always comes in, in is APIs. Either you have an API that you build between your system and another system, or you have an API that sits between your backend and your mobile client, or your backend and your uh, web client. And serverless is great for that because we're talking about API calls. That's like a quick little thing that needs to run. And load can vary a lot over time as well. So serverless really shines for that. Amazing explanation. Yeah. Yeah. Anything with really uh, anything with like real dynamic load where it's constantly changing the the traffic. So if it's fluctuating based on time of day, or maybe you need to support a Super Bowl ad, something of that scale, the ability to scale from zero all of a sudden to millions of uh, people using a particular service, that's, uh, that's where serverless is great. It's just that huge dynamic uh, fluctuating Yeah, scale. it sounds like Data processing is another great one. It sounds like it can vary from small workloads to large. So is there a size differential or is there something that it's more particularly suited towards in terms of workload size or a API calls? I think it actually it works really well for small workloads when you have something every now and then that needs to run, then you don't have to pay for the server 24 seven only when it's executing, but also good for work, large workloads. Like, like uh, you were saying, James here, the Super Bowl ad comes on or Black Friday rolls around and, and it's a, a big variation in, in traffic uh, when it's large, uh, large traffic. So I think it's actually good for both. Awesome. Okay, so we have a lot of questions. So our second question comes from Jayesh who asks, how are serverless architectures better? And I kind of feel like this might be one of those it depends answers, but let's go ahead and go to you, James. Sure. Yeah. So I think to talk about this, one of the useful things to focus on is cloud native architectures. And when you build for cloud native, or it could be also be called 12 factor architectures, when you build for these things that can dynamically scale, can go from zero to as many uh, backing servers as you need, uh, then your architects needs to support that. So it needs to be able to handle that up and down that fluctuation. And uh, there's certain uh, architectural things that make this easier. So for instance, if you don't have any state in your actual application or service, that's one thing that allows you to easily scale up and down. You move that state back to a database, back to a external cache, that sort of thing. And so 12-factor uh, and cloud native are gonna really be the thing that enables you to embrace serverless. And, uh, and that's great whether you're on Kubernetes or on Cloud Run or really any serverless platform. And, and I think I'm working with a large retailer right now, and they're using serverless because they a large retailer, but small team, they can't afford to pay, you know, have lots and lots of ops people monitoring servers, and they want to build stuff and, and enable more services, uh, not sit around and monitor services. So that they've gone serverless for that reason, to make their own team more efficient. Yeah, and I think this is a good segue into our next question, who's from Manyun, who asks, what's the difference between serverless and cloud native? I think we hear both of these terms 
uh, a lot. And I don't know if they're interchangeable, but it sounds like they're related. Um, James, what do you think? Yeah, they're definitely related. So serverless, I look at serverless more of, uh, as Martin was saying, the like operational model of cloud native applications. You certainly can do cloud native without serverless, without going full serverless and without having that dynamic scaling in the managed platform. But if you're cloud native, then it's going to make it a lot easier for you to also be serverless. And so, um, so yeah, if you're, if you're starting with non-cloud native first, focus on being cloud native, and then that will enable you to also be serverless for the operational aspects to that. Yeah. And here's a personal question. Um, you were talking about moving state outside of the application logic. How difficult is it, in your opinion, for companies who may have a monolithic app or legacy applications to move to more of a cloud native or serverless model? It's, it can definitely be challenging because we traditionally have architected applications to be these, uh, what we call, um, we want to treat them as, as uh, what is it, not cattle, uh, cat, or no, we want to treat them as cattle, not um, pets, is the, the yeah. terminology that, that we've heard used. And it's kind of a mean way to talk about cattle because, you know, we love cows. Um, but <laughs> the idea is that with, with your pets, you, you, you really love your pet dearly and you don't ever want that pet to go away. Um, and so with our traditional architectures, we would make sure that that the server should never go down. You try to keep that thing running forever. And if it goes down, you have an outage. Whereas in cloud native, we're actually architecting to support the ability to fail because we know that at the scale and at the, uh, when we move our architecture to, uh, to huge data centers that are managing millions of machines, that things may break uh, at that scale. And so we have to, we have to architect for that. And so that's one of the key things about cloud native is moving that state out. And so it can be a huge challenge to go in cloud native and go in serverless, just things like the file system. In serverless and cloud native, you typically don't write files to the file system expecting them to be there if that server instance goes down. So that means you then have to use an external data store to store your files on. And of course, you can use um, the Google Cloud storage service if you're on Google Cloud uh, or other options as well, depending on where you are, just for files. But then databases are another example where you don't want to run your, you know, back in the LAMP stack days, we would run our Apache server and our MySQL server on the same actual server. And if that thing went down or the hard drive was corrupted, you're in big trouble. Now we need to take those databases and all the, also move them out to an external data store. So you could use things like Cloud SQL uh, as one way to externalize those data stores. But that allows you then to have an elastic application or service tier that can then talk back to that, that backend data store. Yeah, yeah, I think it speaks to this idea of modularization and ensuring that you're separating compute and storage so that you can scale both of those things independently and run in a very distributed environment. Um, okay, so we have a lot of serverless products at Google Cloud or the top three that we always speak about, but Loppy2345 asks here, please explain the difference between App Engine and Cloud Run and which one we should be using. And this is actually uh, one of our more popular questions we've gotten from multiple people. So Martin, why don't you go ahead and take this one? Yeah, I, I think actually over time, uh, we have seen App Engine and Cloud Run becoming more and more similar because as we are all learning about you know, cloud native and, and we are uh, cloud providers like Google and developers like you guys, we are all uh, adopting these uh, best practices that James talked about a minute ago. So because App Engine and Cloud Run adapt, adopt all, all those best practices, they're fairly similar, I would say. And if I start a new project, I think about what does the team know? Does the team know either of these products? Then pick that product. If the team knows both or neither, uh, I would, I guess I would use Cloud Run if I already have a container-based uh, developer workflow, if I like containers, some companies uh, do that because in App Engine, you don't have containers. In Cloud Run, you can have containers if you want to, but both are perfectly good choices. Yeah, and is there a path from App Engine to Cloud Run if somebody was interested? Yeah, you typically in App Engine, for example, you would write a Node app or a Python native app and deploy it to App Engine, and you really don't have to really change anything, uh, or I guess a few a few lines at the top of your file to move it from App Engine to Cloud Run. So it's it's fairly easy. Yeah, then one of the 
the biggest challenges there is just going to a container-based, Docker container-based packaging method. And there is some easy ways to do that. So there's something called build, pla- build packs, and we have the Google Cloud build packs. And they you can take an existing source code base and give it to build packs, and it'll create a container for you. If you need more flexibility or you want to uh, have more control over the process, then you can use a Docker file as the way to define how your container gets created. But both of those are now supported by Cloud Run. So when you do a source-based deployment with Cloud Run, similar to how you do it on App Engine, uh, we will use a Docker file if it exists to create the container, or we'll use build packs to fall back to. Awesome. So it sounds like there are tools that people can use if they're interested in transitioning over. One of the other questions that we get often about Cloud Run is, does somebody need to truly understand containers to use Cloud Run whatsoever? Martin and James, I'm sure you both have <laughs> opinions on this. Yeah, I mean, so it used to be that you had to understand containers and you had to create a Docker file. Uh, so, but now you can do uh, a gcloud a run deploy source, and you just deploy your, like your native Node app or Python app or or, or Java app, and it's deployed uh, from source. And under the covers, it's all containers on Google side, but you you may or may not see the containers so depending on. If you like containers, you can have your own Docker file and do that stuff. If you don't like containers, just deploy from source. But it's all containers over here. Yeah, I feel like that's worth restating um, just how easy the experience can be um, to build from source. For somebody who may not want to understand (laughs) containers at that level, I think it just speaks to how we're continuously creating higher levels of abstraction for those who do want to focus specifically on just the application logic. The nice thing is that containers are still there and they're underneath the covers. So you get that portability that containers gives you where you can take that same container that may have been transparently created for you and run it on Kubernetes, run it via Docker on your local machine, wherever Docker container runs, you can run that container, which is nice to have that portability. So it's still containers underneath the covers, but you don't necessarily need to think about containers and how they get created. Yeah, you can reap the same benefits. That's awesome. So with the next question, Jim H., Uh, This is a little particular, but he wants to share his Python apps APIs with his friends using Google Cloud Run, but he's completely unfamiliar with containers or how he might package his Python or Windows API so he can take advantage of Google Cloud Run. Where does he start? Similar to, I think, what we just talked about, James, you said build packs is one option. Uh, Anything else here to add? Yeah, I think build packs are the really the transparent way to go from that Python source code to a container. Uh, build packs are a cloud native foundation under the cloud native computing foundation. Uh, they're called cloud native build packs. So this is an open standard and Google Cloud has built our build packs. We have samples on our GitHub. Uh, I think it's just called uh, build pack samples. And of course, there's a Python sample there. So check that one out. Uh, and you'll you'll see that with Python, there is one little trick that you need to know about, which is you need to tell the build packs how to actually start your application. And so there's something called a proc file is one way to do that. And so it uh, that's one thing that Python doesn't give us for build packs is the ability to know what application to start in your Python code. Whereas in Node, this is something that you do through an NPM start command. Uh, and other frameworks have different ways to for the build packs to know what command to start. But with Python, we don't know how to start your application. So that's the one little thing that you're going to have to add in uh, potentially from uh, versus what you have now. Um, but yeah, check out the build pack samples for Python. That should be pretty helpful to get you going. Perfect. Awesome. OK, so next question is from Isius. Could you explain how to set up Cloud Run on Anthos? Uh, James, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah, so uh, what's called Cloud Run for Anthos is a way to have the Cloud Run experience on Anthos, which is uh, a way to be multi-cloud, be on-prem with GKE, our Kubernetes engine. And so with Cloud Run for Anthos, you get all the great things about Cloud Run, but you get them on top of GKE. And so you can use this either in our GKE service, you could use it on other cloud providers, you could use it on-prem. And to get started, you first need to have Anthos. And so if you're in the Google Cloud console, if you actually go into Cloud Run and you go try to deploy an application, which you just just say like create service, then you click on Anthos as the deployment target. If you don't already have an Anthos cluster set up, then it will actually help you walk through and, and create that Anthos cluster. There are other ways to create an Anthos cluster on Google Cloud as well. And once you get an Anthos cluster, you can then deploy to it uh, through the Cloud Run UI or through the typical ways that you deploy to Cloud Run, which is like 
like command line is one option. You do G Cloud Run Deploy to deploy your application. You can do that to to deploy to Cloud Run for Anthos as well. So, but the start with the console uh, console dot google or <laughs> console dot cloud dot google dot com and uh, and just go to Cloud Run and pick Anthos as the target and uh, should be pretty straightforward to, to deploy from there. Cool. Sounds like there's a couple of options there to get started uh, with Cloud Run on for Anthos. Um, our next question is from Dheeraj P, who asks, do the environment variables in the Cloud Run dashboard allow KMS encrypted values to be specified instead of publicly exposing database credentials? Uh, Martin, what about you? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So first off, the great question. And the background here is, um, I see that uh, the word public is used here. If you have environment, well, so it used to be uh, for years and years, it has been considered best practice to have things like uh, database passwords, file paths, and things like that as environment variables. So they're not hard coded in your code. That is a great practice. Now, if you lately, so people have started saying, well, actually, if I have it in the environment variables, then if if part of my application, maybe I have a malicious library somewhere in my application that I downloaded, open source something, uh, it could read environment variables. So I want to be even more secure than that. And, and that is, I think, is where this question comes from. So if you have, if you use environment variables in Cloud Run, they're not public. It's only you can see them. But if but you could potentially have a piece of malicious code inside your application that can read environment variables. And the way to get around that, of course, this is, of course, a common problem. And uh, so uh, to get around that, you use Secret Manager, which is part of your Google Cloud account. You just turn it on. And that is a very secure way of storing these secrets, like database pass passwords and so on, if you want to do something that's even more secure than having it as environment variables. And you can set things up so they audited and all that good stuff in Secret Manager. Right. And just for those who haven't heard of Secret Manager, it's a secure and convenient storage system for API keys, passwords, certificates, other sensitive data. And it kind of gives you this central place and source of truth to manage all of these things and audit secrets across Google Cloud. Um, so definitely a great tool to use. OK, so next question comes from George L, who asks, do you have any tips on how to accurately estimate costs for using Cloud Run in this way? Uh, James, I'm going to you for this one. Yeah, so um, cost estimation with something that's elastic can be hard. This is like your power bill, your energy bill that you get from the power company is how much is the bill gonna be next month? I don't know, it depends on how much you use. And so usually the way that we do estimation, just like you probably do estimation of what your energy bill is gonna be, is you base it on what you did in the past. And so based on the the past bill, that's how you can determine likely or the ballpark of your future bill. So usually the way that we do cost estimation when you're in a uh, environment that is scalable like Cloud Run is you do a test with, that tries to simulate what your actual traffic is going to be. And then you take that test and you then see, all right, how much money did we spend with that test? And then you can extrapolate from there how much money it's going to be when you're actually live. Uh, there is a cost calculator that you can use on the Google Cloud website too, but this is not um, exactly going to be give you a real world picture because you're going to have to estimate how many concurrent connections are going to be coming in, which could be really hard to actually estimate in your real world usage of your uh, backend service, your application. So um, so really, to, if you want to get the, the most accurate number, you need to actually run a simulation. Yeah, it sounds like a chicken and an egg problem. You want to you want to find out, but you also need to test it out first. But do you find that there's a certain size in this simulation that you need to run through to experiment and be able to extrapolate, for example, um, you know, scale up to thousands of concurrent con connections? Or uh, is there a certain minimum that you think that people need to run through for the simulation? One of the hard things is that there's a lot of knobs that you can turn to kind of change the behavior. So with uh, Cloud Run, the default number of concurrent connections to a given instance is 80. You can turn that down to as few as one or up to as many as 250 concurrent connections. And this can dramatically impact your bill, but it can also dramatically impact your performance. So if you turn it all the way up to 250, then that's great. That means you're gonna get 250 concurrent connections to a single instance, and you only get billed the CPU and memory time for 
for one instance across those 250 concurrent connections. But if your workloads are very IO and CPU intensive, then you may actually be causing a huge performance degradation by doing this, which then may send more requests to uh, to other instances because they can't handle those requests potentially as fast. And so it's really with simulation testing, um, you want to try to actually make the load look as similar to the real world load that you're going to have and and then turn some of those knobs and see, oh, if I turn the number of concurrent connections up or I turn the number of CPUs up or whatever it may be, then it's going to change some things. And so you're going to have to do some testing to figure out what the optimal configuration is. It's actually one of the really nice things about Cloud Run that you can have concurrent connections. Some of the other serverless platforms actually don't allow you to have concurrent connections, multiple concurrent connections. And so then you're actually paying like per request. You're not getting the advantage of uh, being able to handle many connections on a single instance and only get billed for that one instance. And also, right, right. You and also, in my experience, the application, real world applications I've worked on, it's seldom Cloud Run that, that is the big dollar item bill. It, it is usually bandwidth or databases. Uh, and, and that stuff you're going to have whether you do serverless or not. Um, and uh, so, yeah, in my experience, most of the money lands there. You should uh, perhaps look at, make sure you include bandwidth and databases in when you make estimates. Yeah. Important to be able to isolate the issue during this testing phase. Um, OK, so our next question is from Vildon C, who asks, what if I want to access my private Google Cloud storage from Cloud Run? Um, Martin, why don't you take this one? Yeah, so I'm not sure what Vildon uh, means here, but it could be either I want to access a Google Cloud storage bucket in GCP that's private to me, or it could be that maybe uh, Vildon means uh, Google Drive private storage. So. If it's a Google Cloud storage bucket that is private to only to uh, only Vilden can see it, what Vilden needs to do is to uh, find the name of that uh, compute um, uh, compute engine account that that run Cloud Run runs as, and you and uh, then uh, you, you can find that in uh, in the. Uh, uh, Cloud Console, and then that looks like an email address, and then give access for that account to this Cloud Storage bucket. And then you would read using the Cloud Storage API. It's a library you can you can download. And actually, right. same and, and you're referring to, oh. sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and actually, it's the same thing. If it's Google Drive we're talking about, I've written many applications that access my private drive. Then again, I find that compute um, engine account. It looks like an email address. I share uh, you know, a folder in my Google Drive or an individual spreadsheet. I click Share, paste that, uh, that in there, and uh, give it read access. And now my Cloud Run can read that. And, and the, just like with Cloud Storage, there is a client library you download to access Drive. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't know that you could use the same service account for these external storage locations, too. Um, so. Yeah, we just uh, released a video, I think, is it this week or next week, where we actually have a REST API running on Cloud Run, and the back end is a Google spreadsheet. So you don't have to muck around with databases. It's far easier to have yeah. a spreadsheet as a database, and, and Cloud Run reads from the spreadsheet. Yeah, that's the, awesome. The first time that I added a service account to a Google Drive doc, and all of a sudden, it magically shared, I was just blown away. I was like, whoa, all these identities are connected, and it was pretty awesome. Yeah, see, even we still get blown away, even if you work with it a lot every day. Um, and, and for those of uh, you that are listening or watching, a service account is sort of this special kind of account used by an application or a virtual machine, as Martin was explaining, not a person. So applications use service accounts to make authorized API calls, authorized as either the service account itself or as Google Workspace or Cloud Identity users through this domain-wide delegation. All right, so we have another question here by Dina Karan S, who says, I would like to see how role-based authorization can be done. Uh, James, why don't, why don't we go to you? Yeah, sure. So this is back to the service account. So when you have a service account, you uh, there's there's actually two different sides of the service account in Cloud Run. There's the the service account that the service runs as, and then you can also assign service accounts that can talk to a service. So that's one way that you can control who actually has access to call your Cloud Run service. So if you want to make it so that only particular service accounts can call make a call to a Cloud Run service, you can do that. You can also 
give certain people a role called, I think it's called Cloud Run Invoker Role, which you can say, all right, Martin, you have the Cloud Run Invoker Role for this service, and that allows you to then call that service. So there's a few different ways within IAM in Google Cloud to configure it, but certainly Cloud Run services can be locked down to specific service accounts, specific users, specific roles that can make actual HTTP calls. And if they don't have that, then it's actually Google Cloud that blocks that. Your application doesn't need to have that logic to, to do that block, do that role-based uh, auth. Uh, Google Cloud just does that for you. And also, and, and service accounts, that's great for if you have like machines calling machines and machines calling um, uh, services. Um, I don't, if Dina Karan is talking about end users coming in through a web browser and hitting services, uh, then you probably want to look at Firebase Auth. Uh, that is one way of dealing with it. You put Firebase uh, Auth on your service. And now people can sign in with their Google account or Facebook account, Apple account. There's a bunch of checkboxes. You can turn them on and off. Um, and you should also, I want to put a bug in your ear, Adina Karn, about identity aware proxy. That is also a product that can sit in front of your app engine apps. And when you can, for example, say, everybody at my company can do this and only the people in the finance department can do these access these few services uh, so there are there are many things to choose from but have a look at firebase auth identity aware, aware proxy well i'm very glad you brought that up because this is a perfect segue into our next question who is from neil k and he asks can we expect iap to support cloud run anytime soon we get this question a lot, so uh, yes, definitely. This, this, uh, we're working hard on it. <laughs> <laughs> Always working hard. Um, yes, and as Martin explained, uh, IAP lets you use identity and context to guard access to your applications and VMs. Uh, so you get this central authorization layer for any applications that are accessed by HTTPS specifically. Um, then you can use application level access control models instead of relying on network firewalls. Awesome. And also, so, by the way, if Neil is uh, writing an API specifically um, and it doesn't want to use IAP, um, there, uh, well, there is also the API gateway that was just made available uh, that can do sit in front of your Cloud Run services or uh, functions or whatever and do uh, authentication. So have a look and see if IAP or API gateway is best fit for your app. Awesome. Yeah, and we're going to include, hopefully, the links to some of these uh, in the description after this. Um, so if you want to check out IAP and some of the other things we talked about with service accounts, please go ahead and look, take a look. Um, OK, so our next question is from Senju V, who asks, does Cloud Run support WebSockets? Uh, James, what about you? Sure. Yeah, so this was actually just announced uh, a couple weeks ago, but Cloud Run now generally available supports uh, WebSockets. Uh, I think it's actually still in beta, so maybe not generally available yet. I think those are two different designations, but um, but you can do it. You deploy a WebSocket application today and it should just work. Uh, so there's uh, a few different ways that you can do this. One is that you can do the HTTP 1.1 upgrade to a WebSocket and that works fine. You can also do something over HTTP 2 and use what's called H2C, which is clear text HTTP2. And Cloud Run supports that as the mechanism to connect from essentially the load balancer proxy and your application as well. So a number of different options there. You could also do uh, server send events is a popular option, which does chunked encoded responses. Uh, so that's one way to do it. And then of course, with the support, it also brings gRPC streaming support, bi-directional gRPC streaming support, so your Cloud Run services can actually do bi-directional communication on Cloud Run. Uh, and that I think that actually ends up using uh, HTTP2 underneath the covers usually. But um, really great support for real-time push-based uh, applications and services. Yeah, wow. And because of this bi-directional ongoing conversation between client and server and some of the use cases you just mentioned, do you foresee that this support for WebSockets does actually improve um, application performance for event-driven architectures? Yeah, it definitely is important if you're doing anything event-driven uh, event driven or streaming. Uh, wh where this is important and why um, 
Cloud Run is a great fit for this, is that typically when you have this event streaming services, you have a lot of idle connections. And so these connections are just sitting there waiting for some event to send, send down to the client. And with Cloud Run, because you can support up to that 250 concurrent connections per instance, if a lot of those connections are just idle, that's okay. You're not going to have to spin up, let's say, 250 instances to support 250 concurrent connections. You really could handle that on a single instance. And so that's going to save you money. Uh, so it's just a more efficient way to utilize those resources. So, so yeah, with event-driven architectures, the support for streaming and push and bi-directional communication on Cloud Run is great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think this is really valuable for anyone who doesn't know that concurrent connections on a single instance are possible and that you can use it to get the most value out of this. Um, okay, so our next question is from Du L, who asks, hey, a question about Cloud Run on GKE or Cloud Run for Anthos versus Knative. Uh, is gCloud Run Deploy a thin wrapper on top of kubectl apply? Can I use kubectl only? Are there any features that gCloud Run Deploy provides that kubectl apply doesn't? Uh, I will go to James. Yeah, so great question. So for those that aren't aware, uh, Knative is a way that you can make Kubernetes easier and make it serverless. Uh, and this is actually what's underneath Cloud Run for Anthos. So Knative is an open source project with the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And because it's based on Kubernetes, the tool to interact with it typically is kubectl. It's the kube control, lots of different names for it. But it's a way to take a YAML document and give it to Kubernetes. And so when you work with Knative or Cloud Run for Anthos, you give a document to your Kubernetes cluster that describes the services that you want to have up and running. And so with Cloud Run, the fully managed version, there isn't a, a direct way to do kubectl apply of a document. Uh, and that's because there isn't a Kubernetes cluster actually there. There is no Kubernetes cluster with the fully managed Cloud Run. Uh, there is one of our coworkers, Ahmet, who created a clever way to do this. And so it's simulating a Kubernetes cluster, but then does the what's needed underneath the covers to talk to Cloud Run fully managed. But there is a way to get YAML documents out of Cloud Run fully managed so that then if you are migrating from Cloud Run fully managed to Cloud Run for Anthos or Knative, you can get the YAML document definition that defines your Cloud Run services out, and then you can kubectl apply those into Knative or Cloud Run for Anthos. So there is great interoperability there between them, but because there isn't actually a Kubernetes cluster with Cloud Run fully managed, there isn't a, a, a direct, uh, officially supported way to apply that document. Nice. Okay. Thank you. So oh, at least through kubectl. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Awesome. So, okay, we have a couple more that I'm trying to squeeze in here with the time that we have. So, Raul G asks, is Cloud Trace also available automatically for the Cloud Run service? Uh, Martin. Uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, so, yes, it has some default stuff in there. Uh, often I hear uh, users want to add more stuff. So, you get some tracking for free, or tra some tracing for free. If you want more tracing, you just um, um, pull in the open telemetry or cloud trace libraries, and then you can uh, add more detailed instrumentation. And just so everybody knows, this is a really cool thing, cloud trace. You can, in cloud trace, you can see, for example, like my, my slowest uh, response times, what happens inside those? Is it the database that's holding up the response or is it calling to another service? And you get pretty graphs of that and can troubleshoot and narrow down where things go wrong. Awesome, yeah, definitely leverage cloud trace. Um, Okay, so the next question, the Disco Mole, which paints a very interesting picture in my head, <laughs> asks, can you speed up your cold starts so choosing Cloud Run over AWS Lambda is finally a no-brainer? Uh, Martin, I'll go to you. Yeah, so uh, there are best practices in the Cloud Run documentation for reducing um, startup times and cold start times. But then recently, uh, there is a feature that I use on every single Cloud Run service I deploy now, nowadays, when, even if I'm really concerned about cold starts. And that is a new feature called min instances. So when you deploy your Cloud Run service, you can say, I want there always, I, I don't want it to scale down to zero, so there will be a cold start. I always want there to be at least one uh, server ready with my service loaded on it. So that way, you get way fewer cold starts, min instances. 
and you could set that to be whatever. So it doesn't have to be one. You, if you want there to be a hundred instances just waiting for requests, and you could set it to a hundred, you would of course pay a little bit more money. Um, but uh, but certainly an option to set that to avoid cold starts. Yeah, and there are a couple other things you can do in terms of uh, initialization of the container. Uh, on Cloud Run, right? So like, for example, creating a linear service, reducing module loading that happens if you're on uh, Node.js or Python, shortening your initializations in general. Um, anything else to add in terms of that? Yeah, there, yeah there's a good rundown in the in the docs for Cloud Run uh, about those things. They call out what you described here, Stephanie, and a few other things. I'll point out in the world of Java, that's the world that I'm in, Java, Kotlin, and Scala, there's a, a kind of newer tool called GraalVM Native Image that allows you to take JVM-based applications and ahead of time compile them. And I was able to take an application that would take like five seconds to start. And with GraalVM Native Image, I was able to make it start in like 100 milliseconds. And so if you're in the world of JVM, check out GraalVM Native Image. It's pretty awesome for serverless and, and uh, avoiding cold starts. Sweet. Cool. Check that out. Um, OK, so I think this is our final question that we have time for today, which is from Manpreet S, who asks, it would be nice if we could automate processes in workflows. Uh, I think he wants that to be addressed. <laughs> so uh, Martin, how about you first? Yeah, uh, so I don't know exactly what Manpreet is asking for, what Manpreet means by automating workflows. There is a product that just became available called Workflows. And it works great with uh, serverless uh, or serverful applications. What we've seen when we started using Workflow ourselves is that a lot of the code that we would write you know, um, uh, uh, in, in code, like do this, call this thing, wait if that happens, you can now write declaratively in YAML or in JSON, which is far safer. So all those if statements and all that stuff is sort of declarative in a file that then uh, deals with the basically translating a flow chart into calling services in a certain order and, and branching and so on. Uh, workflows, check that out. Yeah, that just came out in, is it in beta or GA now? I think it might be GA. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's for chaining together APIs, and it would be great to be used in conjunction with Cloud Run and Cloud Functions, for example, or anything that has an API. Um, great. Um, James, do you have anything else to add here? No. Uh, yeah. Thanks for asking us great questions, and hopefully we get to do more of these. Yeah, sweet. Thank you so much, Martin and James, for being on. Y'all provided the most insight on this. And I think this was a very, very valuable and popular topic for people. OK, thank you, everyone else who's watching for joining our very first Ask Google Cloud live chat. Uh, we hope your questions got answered. But if not, we'll be back with more live chats throughout the year. We'll be featuring your questions from YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. So send in your questions using the hashtag AskGoogleCloud. And comment below if you have a question that we didn't get to today. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you all next time. Bye.